Awesome. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this uh, interesting little system, uh, Urbit, that I and some friends built. Um, Urbit is a uh, clean slate uh, full stack system. Uh, so uh, let me explain sort of briefly the problem that we're solving here first, because um, this is a little different from the problem that uh, a usual language is solving. Um, so we have basically a coupling of kind of two interesting problems here. We have a, a very different kind of technical problem that we're solving, and we also have a, a different human market need that we're solving. Uh, so let me go through both of those uh, super quickly. So um, the technical problem I'm trying to solve here is something I'll call a high-level deterministic computer. So that would be basically a computer whose entire life cycle is defined by a single frozen function. So it's really very functional. Um, of course, a, um, a hardware VM, uh, a CPU, is defined by a single frozen function, which is the CPU function, which is very frozen because it's on the chip. Um, <laughs> but um, we'd actually like to define that at a layer at the same level at which the programmer um, you know, conceives of the system. So if we look at some, some kind of approximations to this that exist in reality today, um, you know, JavaScript and the Java VM, of course, are um, high level um, um, definitions, um, but they're defined only sort of for a transient system. So here we're defining the whole life cycle of the computer. We're not, this is not just a memory image, this is a whole machine, which is a single level store. Um, Lisp and Smalltalk have, you know, have these image based systems that come a little closer to this um, kind of approach. I don't think people in practice usually use Lisp and Smalltalk actually as databases, and they're not uh, defined um, you know, kind of functionally in the same way. Um, but it's definitely in the sort of in the image-based uh, you know system tradition. Um, when you're using this thing, it basically feels like an integrated interpreter OS and database, which is a very kind of unusual feeling for a uh, programming environment. Um, you might also ask what happens when a deterministic computer uh, hits an undecidable problem. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, one way of of sort of um, um, defining this problem that I like to use is an unusual versioning system that uh, we use, which I call Kelvin versioning. So Kelvin versioning, you count down to absolute zero and you count by integers. So if you run out of numbers, you've, you've made a mistake, basically. So absolute zero is absolutely frozen. So uh, Urbit, or at least the sort of the formal definition of Urbit, uh, which does fit on a t-shirt, is at 5 Kelvin, which is like liquid helium, basically, at the moment. Uh, and we'll see that spec uh, in a little bit. Um, let's switch gears totally and talk about the human need that this system is supposed to be uh, solving. Um, we have this little problem in the computer world, which is that the internet actually failed. Um, it succeeded very well as a digital modem. It's a great digital modem. Um, it's entirely a client-server environment. It is not a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, it's never going to be a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and if you look at sort of the dream of the internet from the you know, 80s and 90s, it was a dream in which everyone on this network would have their own server, and things like what we do on Facebook today would be done by protocols like SMTP. Well, you can't introduce a new wide area protocol on the internet today. You can barely keep SMTP alive. Um, you know, these systems were designed in the 70s. Uh, the same thing for basically Linux, which is, in a sense, I would say, uh, layer seven of the internet. It's the application layer. Like, if you're on the internet, you're either a Unix box or you're pretending to be a Unix box. I uh, can't really say, uh, you know, I can't really say to my mother, hey, you should go out and get an AWS box and put all your data on that and app get install, you know, uh, something. <laughs> um, that's just never basically going to fly. And so we've kind of. Um, you know, reconciled ourselves to the sort of loss of this dream where people actually control their own individual computing. And instead, we've basically gone, to, gone back and we've, um, you know, recreated uh, the Hayes Modem Protocol with HTTP and we've recreated AOL with Facebook. Um, and we're kind of stuck in this uh, space. So we have a big problem here um, and these systems are basically not fixable. Uh, well, there's a way to get out of a problem that isn't fixable, which is to layer over it. So uh, the browser already did this on the client side. Basically, you had these OS APIs, and they're like, okay, we're going to build a new application layer. I, I guess browser people didn't really realize that this is what they were doing, but it's certainly what they were doing. We're going to build a new programming layer that is isolated from the substrate under it, that cannot call out in any way, shape, or form, and we're just going to program to that layer and not care about the, OS, the underlying OS. Uh, and then actually actually kind of worked great. Um, so on the server side, basically, this hasn't been done yet. 
Um, and I would say basically, we don't know that people don't, don't want personal servers. People, you ask them, like, you tell them what a personal server is, and they say, yes, I want that. We do know that they don't want Linux and the internet personal servers. We do know that my mother is never going to run an open you know, Linux server on the internet. So there's basically a real case to be made for saying, OK, we need a new layer here. Um, if we sort of drill down a little bit and define the need, the need is basically caused by the, um, essentially the obstacle to the universal personal server is just administrative cost. My mother is not a Linux set. So um, when you're looking at a problem and your problem is administrative cost, uh, it makes sense that a solution to this problem is going to be technical simplicity because basically the, the difficulty of administering the system tends to be roughly proportional to the number of lines of code in it. And if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of lines of code in Ubuntu. Um, and um, so basically, you know, the idea of building the browser for the server side is sort of a problem that kind of makes sense next to this problem of let's build a high-level deterministic computer. Um, so okay, let's um, let's build it. Uh, how do you define a one-function computer? Um, well, you need remember we're defining both the network and the OS here. We're really you know defining a computing environment as if we just stumbled on a planet that had chips and wires and no software whatsoever, which is kind of fun. Um, and if you're going to define the way this works, you're defining networking from scratch. Um, I find the simplest way to think about networking is to imagine just basically a global party line. So a packet is just a big integer blob that people put out. Everybody hears everyone else's packets. And if you have the keys to decrypt those packets and make them make sense, then you use them. Then you can basically say to this global party line, hey, um, we would like uh, to actually optimize this. And you, you, you know, get back to routing. But routing is basically an optimization. In, uh, you know, Van Jacobson has this great term, a content-centric content network, um, where you're basically ignoring who sent you the, the packet doesn't matter. What matters is what's in the packet. So that's sort of the, you know, the network pers uh, perspective on, on this. Um, from the, um, um, the sort of functional perspective, there's basically two ways to define a one-function computer. You can define it as a lifecycle function, which is a, where the state is a pure function of input history. And remember, this is a frozen function. This never changes. You cannot upgrade this function. Uh, or you can define it as a transition function, where basically you have an input event in an old state, out comes you know, a bunch of output actions in a new state. Uh, these are really, you know, in practice, basically turn into the same thing. In practice, essentially any um, life cycle function is going to wind up spending most of its time as a transition function, because you're certainly not um, going to recompute the whole lock every time you get a, a packet. Um, and one of the advantages of doing it the life cycle function way is when you're basically building this system where you have one frozen function which defines the semantics of every computer in the world, um, you need to basically break symmetry. And you need to basically, when you're starting that up, you need some startup packets, you need some startup, you, know, you need to load an operating system into your function, essentially. Um, and so a life cycle function makes slightly more sense as a way to define this. Um, let me skip um, um, down for a second and talk about how you implement these things. Actually, um, implementing, some, uh, implementing a sort of one function computer like this is kind of very easy with the kind of substrates that you have at the moment. Um, event sourcing is basically this pattern. Um, it's usually not used for a general purpose computer, but it's the same pattern. Um, you have low, la low latency reliable logs are like, you know, uh, uniformly available. Uh, Kafka isn't the greatest thing in the world, but it works fine. Uh, normal databases are defined in terms of an append-only transaction log and um, a, 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 an image snapshot. So you're basically using, you're basically building this the same way a normal database is built. You're saying every packet is a transaction. Um, and it basically works great. You can also do non-packet I.O. I mean, I like to think of an abstract computer as just packets in, packets out. Um, but you know, like you'll, as you'll see, you know, we want to serve web pages and so forth. So basically, you can model um, even ordinary, you know, like HTTP requests. Is you know, here's an event that's like you got a request. Here's my action. Respond to this request. So um, there's a great library, libuv, which is used by Node.js that implements these patterns very nicely. So it's super easy to do. Um, I mentioned decidability earlier. That's kind of an interesting problem for a deterministic computer or any kind of non-preemptive OS. Um, when you're building a non-preemptive system, basically the decision of when to terminate a computation is essentially a heuristic choice. Um, if, you're, if that event is caused by a console, that heuristic choice is very easy. Just go until they hit Control-C. 
Um, if it's a packet, that's a little harder. You need to decide when to time that out. There's a kind of nice duality between unreliable packet networking and Turing completeness in that sort of when you drop a packet because it's spending too long, you're essentially detecting congestion um, in the CPU. Um, and so that, that kind of makes a certain amount of sense. Um, Node.js has shown that you can actually do very useful things with non-preemptive systems. One of the most interesting problems in building a system like this is you're going to have certain kinds of non-determinism that you can't avoid. Let's say I write an infinite loop. I made a mistake. I wrote an infinite loop. I press Control C. One thing I really want there is a stack trace. So that stack trace is completely non-deterministic information. You can't you know, uh, uh, get that in a deterministic way. But all is not lost because basically your interpreter, uh, your, the underlying C code that actually implements this system, sees that stack trace, has that stack trace. All it needs to do is basically inject that back in as a deterministic event. And so basically you get an event that says, hey, I was trying to do this packet, but it crashed, and here's where it crashed. And then you can route that to the user in the appropriate way, and that actually works. Um, so if you replay that log, you know, we've replayed like 30 gigabyte logs and whatnot for the same bit for bit state, right? Um, if you replay that log, it will replay the error, but, uh, essentially, it won't even bother with the original transaction. So this is, you know, this is not pie in the sky, this is clearly, I mean, this is a working system, this is clearly doable. Um, so uh, probably a lot of uh, Lisp uh, fans in the audience, uh, let's try doing this in Lisp. Um, so it's actually easy to define a lifecycle uh, function in Lisp. You simply say, okay, the first uh, event in the log is my operating system, and all the rest of the log, the cutter of the log, is the rest of the events. So run the operating system on the rest of the events. I used to have to write the function, but okay, you know, you've, you've made progress. Uh, and now all we need is the one true Lisp. Uh, so, um, um, you know, I think all Lisp needs is the one true Lisp. Um, there have been a lot of attempts to create the one true Lisp. Uh, it haven't really worked out. Um, in my view, that's basically a problem that goes back to really the root of how we came up with this idea of computing. Because, um, you know, Lambda Calculus is, you know, it's, it's, okay, we're a Lambda Conf, I can't say bad things about Lambda Calculus, but um, it was originally designed not as a means of programming, it was originally designed as basically a metamathematical tool. And people picked this up and they found, hey, wow, this thing that Church came up with actually works like really well for programming. So you take that in one direction and it becomes Lisp. You take that in another direction, much more mathematical, and it becomes Haskell. Um, and uh, it's not like Lisp and Haskell are like compatible in any ways. You're always basically taking Lambda and you're growing hair on it to make it a practical system. Um, and I, I would say that that comes from basically a sort of very deep kind of conflict in the, the, you know, the heart of Lambda, which is that it has these features that are like symbols and variables and scope that are features of a higher level language. But if you want to use that as an axiomatic system, and we just saw a talk on Shen which compiles to Lisp, if you want to use that as an axiomatic system basically and put the higher level language as something that is actually loaded onto that axiomatic interpreter, then those things are in the wrong place, they're in the wrong layer. And if you're going to build an axiomatic system like this, you have just the demands on the precision of your interpreter are just extremely high. You want that to be just tiny and diamond perfect. And you can't grow hair on it. So in, in a way, basically, you sort of have no choice but to invent a kind of different computational model at the bottom um, end. So, um, this uh, you know, gives me a motivation to uh, actually uh, you know, invent all this crap. Um, you know, we know that you should never invent anything, but uh, sometimes you have no choice. So um, <laughs> the bottom of the stack is this thing called NOC. It's a uh, typeless frozen combinator interpreter, non-lambda. It's defined in 200 words. It fits on a t-shirt. Um, I'm not wearing a t-shirt today, but I'll, I'll wear it tomorrow. Uh, um, and um, the, I know, I know, it's a bad choice. Um, on top of that is uh, Hoon, which is a pure script type functional language. Um, it compiles itself to NOC. Um, this is type functional programming without category theory. Um, we've heard from some people that they hate category theory. Uh, I've heard that somewhere, not sure, probably not in this room. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so, you know, you can see how if you have a compiler that compiles itself to NOC, then, you know, you can kind of bootstrap off of this basic, you know, essentially bootloader. On top of that, we have Arvo, which is a non preemptive uh, OS. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see. So basically what I'm gonna do here is just a really lightning tour through these three systems. Um, don't worry if there's, there might be a little bit of stuff you don't understand, but like, you know, just, just kind of sit back and get an impression of the system. 
All right, let's go into NOC um, for a second. So I sometimes call NOC a functional assembly language. You can program in NOC, but there are no symbols or anything, so you're typing numbers and doing tree geometry by hand. Uh, very much like writing assembly language. You could, but you wouldn't want to. Um, it's basically, a, it is a lisp in a sense. It's a lisp without any of these high-level tools. How do you get symbols out of a lisp? Well, maybe it's not a lisp. Um, and, um, a key point, uh, no cyclic data structures, no laziness, so no infinite data structures. You cannot, knock as an interpreter which cannot create cycles. Um, I think that is basically very much the right choice in the modern world. Um, no tracing garbage collectors, uh, kind of nice. Um, if you also remember this is a persistent system, and if you look at persistent systems, any kind of database, you know, whether it's NoSQL or SQL, basically you'll see acyclic data structures everywhere there. You will not see very, very, very many successful data, uh, databases that use cyclic data structures. Um, and um, it's also, if you're sending data over the network, uh, you know, how do you send a lazy list over the network? Uh, how do you send a cycle over the network? It, I mean, you can, it's a little bit harder. Um, and so this is definitely, very much designed for kind of the network edge, obviously. Um, it should be extremely efficient. We'll get to how that works in a bit. It should fit on a t-shirt. It should be obviously perfect. Um, I believe that actually I've hit these points. Um, uh, so concepts in NOC. Uh, quick, so uh, value in NOC is a noun. A noun is basically our version of S expressions. Um, it's S expressions about the S because basically all that stuff has been stripped off. Lisp essentially, I would say, has almost kind of a dynamic type system for atoms. Uh, which you need if you don't have another type system on top of it, because how do you print an atom? Um, well, if you have a type system, the type system will tell you how to print the atom. But if you don't have an atom, um, so basically an atom is just an unsigned integer of any size. We use this, you know, an atom will be a number, it could be a string, it could be a network packet, it could be a giant file. Um, it's a blob. Um, but a blob as a number, not as a blob and as a number, and this is how long the number is. Um, a cell is an order pair of any two nouns. Uh, we don't do pointer comparison. We don't do this. This abstraction is completely semantically opaque. Um, knock itself is a function from two nouns or a, a cell of nouns, a subject and a formula to a product. Subject is the data. Formula is the function. A product is the result. And the way we define knock, we define errors as non-termination. So errors are basically anything that produces bottom. Uh, obviously, we don't do that in practice, but. Um, the, um, that's how, how we define the function. Um, so let's go over the spec. We'll see this, the NOC spec in two slides. Uh, these are reduction rules. Um, you see four base, basic operators here. Uh, the first one is question mark, or as I would say, what? Um, this is a deep operator, so is this a cell or it's an atom? If it's an atom, it's, uh, if it's a cell, it's zero, meaning true, and if it's an atom, it's one, meaning false. Um, zero for true, one for false. Probably a decision I might do differently next time. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's morally right and it works. Um, we can also uh, increment an atom. That's our only arithmetic operator is increment. Uh, and you see if you, if you try to increment a cell, it reduces to itself, which means an infinite loop, which means an error. Um, you can test for equality, same thing. You can't test for an, an atom for equality. Um, and the only interesting operator here is this slash, which is a slot, which is a tree addressing scheme. So in, um, in this tree addressing scheme, basically, um, one is the root of the tree, 2n is the left child of any node, 2n plus 1 is the right child. So basically, having this kind of simple tree addressing built into the fundamental interpreter is what lets us not have to deal with scopes and environments and basically all that jazz that we know and love from, from Lisp. Um, so that's all higher level stuff. All right, so this is the rest of the NOC spec. Um, this is a complete spec here. Um, so the first reduction rule here is kind of interesting. This is something I call uh, autocons. So basically, if you have a NOC formula, um, either the head of that formula, the formula is always a cell, it's always a pair. The head of that formula is either a cell or an atom. If it's a cell, then what we have here is a pair of two formulas, and the semantics of that is consing those formulas. So basically, you can build up, you know, cons is essentially an implicit operator in a way here. You can build up, you just, you know, glom formulas together and you get this kind of automatically cons thing. Um, otherwise, the, um, so if you see uh, A here is the, is always the subject and um, then we're pattern matching um, in the formula. This is, this by the way, is not the syntax for anything, this is just pseudocode. Obviously, if you're writing axioms at a certain level, they're written in English. Um, the, um, um, so if the first, um, um, if the head of a formula is um, a number, then um, if it's well-formed, otherwise you see down at the bottom, um, 
You know, anything that's not well-formed resolves to itself, again, an error. Um, if it's well-formed, um, we have instruction zero, which is just the slot operator. So that lets us basically pick out a subtree of the subject. Um, and um, then, you know, one, constant. Uh, two is eval, so basically, um, B and C here are not our, our formulas against the current subject for a new subject and formula that we're going to evaluate. Um, again, pretty straightforward. Three, four, and five are the deep, bump, and same operators that we've seen before. Um, depth test, uh, um, increment, and equals. Um, those are actually all the operators that we need for not to be as expressive as it wants to be. So we could actually throw away six through ten completely and have a much shorter, cleaner spec. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are simpler Turing complete interpreters in this, certainly. So, um, you know, this is a, intended to be a practical uh, Turing complete interpreter. Uh, and it is actually practical, believe it or not. Um, and uh, you probably don't believe it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, um, but um, um, so six is, uh, I'll, I'll leave you as an exercise to the reader if you can figure out how these macros work, but six through 10 are all macros. Uh, six is if then else. Uh, seven uh, composes two formulas. A composes a formula with um, the cell of the product of the formula. It's basically declaring a variable. Essentially, you're, you're, you're using, you're putting a new value onto that subject and then using it for the next formula. Um, nine is essentially implementing what whom will use as a function call to be very uh, to simplify it enormously. And ten is a hint. So you see two tens there because you can have a dynamic hint or a static hint. What a hint is in this environment is an instruction that throws away data. So if, you're, if you discard data, basically you're saying to the interpreter, do whatever you want with this data. Do something with it. You know, so um, hints are anything like a debugging printf is a hint. You're like, uh, I, yeah, I don't know that a debugging printf happened, but um, if you want to make it happen, make it happen. Um, memoization, there's a memoization hint. You know, that's another good example. So the hint basically doesn't change the formal um, uh, result of the computation, but it helps the interpreter do something interesting with it. Um, so that's all of NOC. Um, you know, uh, and uh, now let's, um, here's, here's a little example. So uh, not, of course, the only um, integer operation is uh, increment. So if you want to decrement, uh, well, that's a little bit of a problem. You actually have to write some code. Um, you're going to actually have to count up to n minus 1 to decrement. Um, not a big deal, very simple algorithm. Um, so here, uh, we're jumping ahead, and on the right side of your screen, basically, you're seeing um, some coon. Uh, those are two basically kind of alternate syntaxes for whom. One of them is a keyword syntax, which you can probably read just by looking at it. Uh, the other one is a rune syntax, which you probably can't read, but that's what we actually use in practice. It's kind of training wheels, no training wheels. Um, and on the left is the uh, actual knock formula that we generate from this. Um, if I had a couple more hours, I would actually go through this formula, but uh, as, as it is, it'll just have to serve as, as an example. All we're doing is we're basically saying, okay, we're going to call the subject A, because that's the number we're decrementing. We're going to add a counter, which is zero. Uh, we're going to loop, and we're going to count up to uh, uh, until you know, the increment of B is A. If that is true, our product is B. Otherwise, we're going to loop again with B changed to the increment of A. Pretty straightforward decrement, not super hard. Um, so, um, but that kind of brings up a problem um, that you uh, might think of, which is uh, G, O of N decrement. Well, uh, you know, if you actually run, if you try to boot Urbit with a completely naive interpreter, it will immediately start decrementing and keep decrementing until pretty much the end of time. So um, that's clearly basically a non-starter. Uh, there's a well-known solution to optimization problems of this kind. It's called the sufficiently smart interpreter. Um, all your interpreter has to do is simply recognize that uh, it needs to analyze the algorithm that it's interpreting, recognize that it's a decrement algorithm, and um, you know, implement it efficiently accordingly. We also need to recognize add, multiply, and you know, all other interesting functions. So if you know anything about compiler theory, you know that this is a very hard problem. Um, fortunately, there's a much easier problem which is related to it. Uh, we don't have to recognize every decrement. We just have to recognize the one that we actually call, which is the one in the standard library. Um, and so, um, basically, the way we optimize in the system, and this should be sort of compared to, let's say you're building, you know, you're using Java, you're using Python. What you do, um, 
you know, is you say, okay, I wrote some pure code, it's beautiful, it's fast enough, oh, it's not fast enough. Um, and I guess I need a, ma a native method. So uh, then you call it to C, you rewrite your uh, inner loop or whatever in C, you throw away the original pure code. Uh, there's another great advantage, which is that your inner loop in C can make system calls. So it can modify the file system or something. Um, and, um, you know, that is um, uh, not necessarily a very functional way of um, proceeding. Uh, the way we optimize knock and hoon is a little different. So we basically say, when you write, say, decrement, you say, okay, I'm going to declare this in a namespace. I'm going to say the, to the interpreter, I believe this to be decrement. It's just a conventional name. This is decrement. The interpreter is like, oh, he says this is decrement. Is this true? Well, gee, I'm built to recognize literally, you know, with a hash of the formula, I'm built to run this specific formula efficiently. So I'm going to match this, which is a slightly hard problem, but not a super hard problem. I'm going to match this at runtime, and then I'm going to do the efficient decrement. So the advantage of this approach, I mean, there's a number of advantages of this, of this approach. First of all, you have both those routines, the fast decrement in C, which is totally an implementation detail, and the, you know, you're separating mechanism and policy there, essentially. So you have your fast decrement in C, and then your, your you know, essentially executable specification of decrement, um, and you're basically binding the two together. Um, one of the, so obviously there's no, you know, you can test these against each other at runtime if you choose. Um, there's certainly, you can sandbox your jet, so it you know, has no reason to make system calls. Um, you can also extend this up the stack, um, you know, quite a ways. So, you know, for example, um, you know, we have um, one of the, you know, the, we, we serve our own website using Urbit, um, and um, one of the, you know, we serve it for Markdown. So we have a Markdown parser written in Hoon. Well, it's a decent Markdown parser. It's maybe not the world's fastest. Um, fortunately, Markdown is a standard for some guys with the word standard. Um, and um, we basically jet that Markdown parser with an efficient common mark implementation in C. Or, you know, for another, you know, example is uh, Google has this lovely library called TensorFlow. Uh, they recently announced that basically they built an ASIC for TensorFlow. Uh, I don't know how exactly the pro programmer talks to that ASIC, but I'm sure it's a mess. Um, what you actually want to do is basically say, okay, I as a programmer, I'm using TensorFlow of this version. I run Tensor, I, I declare that this is TensorFlow of a certain version. And then my interpreter is like, aha, I have a chip that can speed up TensorFlow of this version. I'll just use that. Um, and so that scales kind of to more, in more interesting ways than the, let's call it to C, uh, you know, um, model scale. So we also use it, by the way, to virtualize knock. So there's actually a virtual knock written in knock if you thought knock was slow. Um, but basically, you can get un unlimited levels of virtualization pyramid by basically just recognizing that you're running your own virtualizer and just saying, hey, we're at six levels deep. Um, so that's an improvement as well. All right, uh, we're done with knock. That's knock. Uh, pretty cool. Let's build on uh, Hoon. Um, Hoon obviously needs to compile itself to uh, knock. Uh, it needs to be a pure strict higher order check functional language because that's the hotness. Um, it needs to have a certain, I believe it needs to have a simple transformation to knock. So I'm a, really a Unix and C guy. I'm not a functional programming guy at all. Um, and actually don't know any other functional languages. Um, and um, so that sort of simplicity, that feeling that basically the compiler is doing something very simple for you is really like a wonderful feeling when you're working inside C. Like you need, you're seeing the system basically at two levels. Uh, we definitely want a system that um, doesn't require people to have a math degree. Um, and um, that's a you know, subject of complaint. I think more generally, one of the things that languages like Haskell do is they encourage, they're functional programming languages, and they encourage you to use these powerful tools as kind of much as possible. Um, Kuhn is kind of the opposite. It encourages you to not use these tools. Um, it's basically like, okay, the power is there if you need it, but bear in mind when you're using this kind of functional power, you're imposing cognitive overhead on the ordinary programmer because we really want, you know, this to be something that a Python programmer can pick up and program in. Um, and, you know, I think the ability to basically teach people these, you know, higher order constructs is, you know, really debatable. I don't think it's proven at all. Um, there's another thing that often happens both with macros and with kind of advanced functional languages where you get into this kind of DSL pattern where basically you're, you're so higher order, you're so meta that, you know, every file is written in its own language. 
uh, which basically gets you to write only code, and that's like a kind of serious downside of functional programming. Um, and you know the thing is, Hoon is still basically almost as expressive as Haskell. Uh, it has you know the equivalent of type classes. It has genericity. It's like you know it's not Haskell. Uh, you know Haskell people will be a little disappointed in it, but it's it's definitely not Lisp. Um, okay, so uh, let's go a little more into detail on Hoon. Um, so basically, the back end of Hoon is extremely simple. So type inference and code generation together, 1,500 lines of code. Um, shouldn't be super hard to learn. Uh, so where basically Knock is doing subject and formula to product, of course in Hoon we have an actual expression that is written in for some values of the word uh, user level code, user level code. Um, the experience of programming without an environment or without a scope or without a heap or without you know the sort of extra piece of state where you just have the subject is just one noun and everything that you need is in the subject is sort of somewhat unique and different. Uh, you keep sort of reaching for that, you know, oh, there must be something that has my variables. But no, there's really just one noun that you're, that you're defining a function against. Um, so um, when we basically take, uh, you know, a type system and layer it on, on top of knock, uh, we're basically computing a mapping from a type and an expression to a type and a formula. So we have input type or subject type and expression turns into um, product type and the knock formula that computes that expression. So again, a very, very simple, straightforward kind of relationship to, uh, to knock here. Um, the inference algorithm is extremely stupid. It infers only forward. It does not use uh, unification at all. Um, it can infer uh, head recursion, uh, tail recursion, but not head recursion. Um, you know, so a general pattern is you need a few more sort of casts to help the type system out. It's still a strict type system. Um, but um, you, you know, you need to you need to help it a little bit. Uh, my view is that basically having a stupider inference algorithm is again a UI win for a language, um, because basically when you program in a language, you kind of need to follow what the compiler is doing. Um, the more powerful the algorithm you're following, basically the harder it's going to be for people to follow. And so you know, when I look at Haskell, I see basically kind of two kinds of Haskell users in a way. I see people who treat Haskell is a black box and are like, it's sort of the learn you a Haskell kind of way. And they're like, oh, I made it work, cool. Um, and then there are the people that actually understand the math. And kind of both of those, you know, kind of situations don't scale in a way. Um, and so having a simpler system is definitely, um, I think, a win. Um, so a um, little more about Kuhn. Um, so uh, this is a broad thing for some criticism, but um, Kuhn uh, basically, since it sort of has its own way of doing things, we invent a lot of terms because basically the ordinary terms tend to be confusing. So, uh, and we also have a four letter uh, name kind of convention going on. So an expression or an AST is a twig. Um, a type is, well there's actually three things that are basically correspond to a type. So a type as in sort of a set of nouns and a semantics ascribed to them is called a span. A type in terms of a constructor is called a mold, and then we also have basically at the kind of OS level, I don't think I'll get into that today, uh, basically the equivalent of mind types, which is something else also entirely. Um, looking at molds, basically Hoon is a pure prototype language. There's no syntax for defining a span. The only thing you can define are, just, uh, are twigs. So when you want to define basically a span, a range, a type in the usual sense, a set of nouns that you're interested in, what you define is actually a normalizing function that takes an arbitrary noun and produces a noun of that type that you're interested in. Um, what's kind of nice about that is that basically if this is the way you define types, Anytime you define a type, you've defined a validator for untrusted network data. So we do a fair bit of uh, validating untrusted network data in today's you know, environment, so that's kind of a win. Um, basic uh, concepts of the type system, this is almost a complete definition of the Hoon type system. It's missing a little bit of stuff. Um, I'll see if I can fill that in, but we're, uh, we've got to move pretty fast here. Um, so, and I'm not going to talk about twigs at all because once you understand basically a data representation, it's pretty straightforward. So a span defines a set of nouns. What can this set be? Um, it can be noun, which means it could be any noun, any remembered S expression basically. Uh, it could be void, which is an empty set. Um, I'm going to skip over Adam and core because I have separate slides for those. A cell, obviously a cell. Here's the span of the head and the span of the tail. 
Um, a face, basically, we're going to label this span. And so remember that there's no symbol table, there's no anything in here. So the labels actually live inside the type. So when you're searching for a label, you're actually doing a depth first search of basically the type of the subject. Uh, fortunately, computers have gotten a lot faster. Uh, you can cache this, we do cache it, but I mean, fine, it's a depth first search. How big is your subject, right? Um, uh, you can have a fork, which is a union of spans. Pretty obvious. Uh, and the only really interesting one on this page is hold. So um, basically, one thing we never do in this system is we never calculate type signatures. So um, this is a strict system. We can't do laziness. What hold means is basically the span here is the result of if you take subject P and run expression Q against it. So this is very much manual laziness. Um, manual laziness has some nice benefits, namely you can use this as a, you can use a manually lazy span as a key in a key value data structure, which is pretty difficult with infinite data structures. Um, and um, so that's basically, um, those are the simple ones. Let me get to the non-boring spans, atom and core. So atom is just an atom. Uh, slightly non-boring in that you can say this could be any atom or you can say this could be a constant. So the unit there is Hoon's equivalent of maybe. Um, and so, you know, if that's set, then we have, you know, this is just a constant atom. Then we have P there is something interesting. The term is a symbol, essentially. Um, and we have what I call an aura. Uh, this is a uh, soft type. This is a basically non-enforced type or enforced gently type. Um, and if you remember, you know, Lisp, of course, has this dynamic type in its atoms, which is just really awful in my, you know, personal opinion. Um, and if you have a type system, basically the type system, when it has an atom, needs to be able to, to describe how do you print this atom. Um, gee, what happens if I try to use, uh, you know, a, a furlong as if it was a Fortnite? Um, what happens if I try to use an IP address as if it was a string? All those are atoms. Um, and so you basically need to label those and describe them kind of informally. And there's a um, basically a system of specialization simply by the length of the name. So you can basically text, ASCII text, ASCII text with a symbol constraint. None of the, all these are informal conventions. None of them are, there's no dependent types in the system. Sorry, yet another no dependent types. Um, and um, um, they're not enforced at all, except that basically, if you want to cat, if you want to turn an IP address into a string, basically, and you know, be so foolish, you have to manually tell it. You know, you have to cast up to just a raw atom, and then down back to your uh, your, your string. So you have to work to basically screw up that way. Um, that's an interesting design. Uh, you know, uh, you don't usually see a soft type in a functional language. I think it's worked pretty well. It's not perfect. Um, I think the, mo the most interesting span, and remember a span is, a, any, is describing a set of nouns. Um, the most interesting one is core, which is um, essentially an object, or it's an object that's sort of in a, in a very broad and general sense. It's actually the general case of objects and functions and a lot of other things which you don't really have a name for. Um, a core is a cell. The head of the cell is a battery, which is either one formula or a tree of formulas. Uh, remembering a formula is just a not function. Um, the tail is a payload, which is basically any noun. Um, and um, when we run the arms, which are the basically, they're not methods, they're computed attributes in the battery, we run that with the whole core as a subject. So we basically have this thing that has a bunch of code in it. It's like, you can think of, if you know uh, C++ implementation, you can think of it as like a V table. Um, right, and so it's here's a V table with a bunch of formulas in it, and you say, I want to run, I want to get foo out of this core. It's like, oh, great, I have a foo. I'm going to basically calculate, you know, that, that's going to resolve to this calculation. Um, so there's no separate namespace for basically data and for code. So if you're looking for foo on a core, and the core doesn't have foo, there's no foo in the battery, um, then um, it goes in and says, oh, well, let's look at the payload. Let's, des let's descend down the tree. Uh, notice also, again, that there is no attempt to create a type signature here. Um, so this is just a map of a term to the twig. Twig is a source. That's a source expression. So basically, and that's in the type. So when I call foo on this core, I basically go in and I say, well, OK, that's going to generate one of these hold things. So it says, OK, um, the result, the type of the span of the result of, of this foo is basically the core type and the twig. And so when we actually evaluate that, we have to basically manually work through the laziness and say, oh, well, what's in that type? Gee, I don't know, let me calculate it and find out. 
Um, that actually, you know, that works rather well. Um, let me, okay, here's some advanced uh, theory. I'm gonna go over this super quickly. So hold again is manual laziness. Uh, one of the nice things about it is that basically you can build a conservative work list algorithm. Let's say you're building a linked list. Let's say you wanna do a type comparison on two linked lists. Okay, now this is a basically, um, you know, this is a structural comparison. So you're saying, you know, these could be totally different definitions of linked list. Do they match? So um, if you basically traverse this, um, um, this span, what you're gonna see is that that traverse repeats itself. And because it repeats itself, you can say, oh, uh, gee, I already checked that there were no violations on this, this arm, on this branch, so um, I'm gonna call that fine. And that's basically how you can do sort of type logic in this manually evaluated space. Again, very, very stupid. If you ask you know, any smart undergraduate, you come, come up with this scheme. Um, a little more, at a little more depth, I'm going to go over this super quickly, you may not understand it. Um, basically, in uh, polymorphism, you have two, um, there, you know, a lot of different kinds of languages. I'm thinking of like Eiffel and the, like the Bertrand Meyer kind of world of languages have basically two kinds of polymorphism. You have variance and you have genericity. So um, basically, any polymorphism in any system like this is about basically, if I change a core, Let's say, okay, I built this core, I, I stuck this battery on this payload, but now I changed the payload. Maybe I changed the payload to something of a different type. Can I run this core? So basically, you know, can I run this arm or will it just be a, a total disaster? Uh, and that question is actually answered when you try to run the arm. So, um, you know, there's a you know, sort of simple question of variance, basically. Can I use this one payload as another payload? Um, the way we do genericity is, um, I can you know, sort of explain this intuitively at a very high level. Uh, when you're doing genericity, you're basically saying, you know, when you're doing variance, you're basically saying, okay, can I, does my mutated payload work like the original payload? When you're doing genericity, what you're saying is, uh, you're saying, okay, I changed the type of this payload. I changed to something totally different. Now I'm gonna run this arm on it. I'm not gonna recompile this arm. I'm gonna run the original not formula that was calculated for something of a totally different type. And the question you have to answer is, is that gonna work? And what span is it gonna produce? Um, and um, you're basically treating the twig, you're treating the arm as a macro, and, and, and essentially, and essentially working through it. So it's like the classic example, can you build a function to swap two things of an arbitrary type? So, you know, yeah, you, you basically do that with genericity um, in, in Hoon. So that, that works, that's how we do containers, all the usual, you know, jazz. Um, and it's essentially kind of this like ghetto low rent way of doing tech classes. Um, syntax design, let's go into the syntax. Hoon has a very unusual syntax you've seen uh, already. Uh, a lot of people think it looks pretty gnarly. Um, there is a reason for doing this gnarly thing. The reason is that basically there are kind of three problems that uh, you see in a lot of functional languages that are syntactic problems. Um, one problem is that basically expressions slope downward and to the right, and so they keep attacking your right margin if they get too complicated. In a procedural language, you've got this nice division between statements and expressions, and statements flow down and expressions flow across, and it gives you this kind of nice tree-shaped structure which you know, lets you work within an 80-column margin. Um, in a functional language, you often don't have that, so you get this you know, kind of slanty thing, which is uncomfortable to work with. Uh, another problem in syntax that a lot of these languages have is they have this unpleasant choice between am I going to have 17 parentheses in a row or am I going to do significant white space? Uh, both of those have, they work, they work, they just have, they're just not super pretty. Um, another problem that I don't know if everyone has this problem, I certainly have this problem when I look at, you know, lisps and a lot of similar things is basically I can't distinguish special forms from symbols. I can't distinguish is this part of the language or is this some, something that somebody included from the library? Uh, or is it a macro? Um, and basically, making that, again, getting away from this sort of pervasive DSLization um, is uh, definitely a goal of the system. Um, speeding up a little, so um, let me, before showing the, the syntax, basically a twig structure. Once again, um, the twig is a Hoon AST. Um, you can um, um, do, uh, a, Hoon has the same kind of auto cons feature that um, Noct does. So basically, cons is assumed. If you basically make a cell of two Hoon twigs, that's a cons. Um, in general, as opposed to Lisp, Hoon is kind of more pair oriented and more tuple oriented. We don't throw in terminators everywhere willy nilly. Uh, that's kind of more appropriate for a type system, I think. 
Um, most twigs um, are tag unions, so they have a head, which is a, a stem, which is a symbol, and a bulb, which is, you know, the tail, which is totally dependent on, um, on, on, the, on the stem. Um, it's usually a tuple or a list of twigs, and let's see how that um, works in practice. So basically, there is a regular form. Again, most, most bulbs are tuples. Uh, some are in area, and there we do need a terminator. Um, but what we do is we separate, we basically have two regular forms of syntax, one which sort of looks like an expression and one which looks like a statement. And so those two ifs there are the same code, um, but they look a little different. Um, and what you do is you basically build these, you know, a structure whose backbone is basically tall twigs. And then um, a, a tall twig can contain a flat one, but not vice versa. So basically you're mimicking the kind of structure of imperative code that has this kind of statement expression duality, but it's, it's all an expression. There's no uh, imperative anything. Um, another thing that you're doing basically to control the right margin here, which you really want, you'll notice that C is at the same indentation as the if there. So um, basically, you want to lose no space, basically, for your largest, you know, hopefully C is the biggest branch. C is not the biggest branch. You want unless instead of if. Um, but basically, you really, you know, as a programmer, there's sort of an art of arranging these things. And you arrange them so that they flow down and not across. Um, and it becomes very easy to read once you know it, like any language. Um, and here's the. Um, the funnest and most fancy part of our crazy syntax. So um, first of all, you've got regular forms and irregular forms. So in a regular form, arbitrary syntax, uh, at least it's always flat, um, but that's just something you have to learn. Uh, you know, one of the things I feel, if you look at the like implementation of the Hoon compiler, uh, what you'll see is that basically the front end is actually as big as the back end, which is really quite unusual. Um, and um, that's because basically as a human being, you've got you know, this great hardware for basically parsing. Uh, you don't have hardware for type inference. Um, and uh, so um, um, what we've done is basically um, the keyword form that you saw, remember you saw those two forms of whom, one using keywords and one using um, runes. I'm going to step forward and show you. Here are two forms of uh, fizzbuzz. On the right, you see runes. On the left, you see keywords. Um, stepping back for a second, to make these um, basically pronounceable, what we've done is taken every ASCII character and given it a, um, um, a single syllable name. So where, if you see um, like if here, so if is the colon prefix if there. That's also the symbol that's actually in the, the physical twig. Um, you can also, as a syntax, you can say question colon. I wouldn't say question colon, though. I would say what colon. Um, which is a lot faster than saying question colon, not to mention ampersand. Um, and um, so basically, you know, everyone who, who, who's learned this is like, you know, why doesn't everyone know this and why do I have to say tilde to like my normal friends when I could say sick? Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully it'll catch on. If, if it doesn't catch on, at least it's useful in whom. So if we, if, if we go back to this and we look at the right, um, you would say gate and fast atom, or you would say uh, barkis and fast atom for the start of that. Um, uh, let me give you, uh, you know, 20 seconds to just observe the, uh, the fizz buzzes here. I think the, the one on the left should be at least uh, pretty readable. Okay, so that's Hoon. Uh, let's move up on up to Arvo. Um, now we're at the operating system level. Um, the, uh, the kernel of Arvo is a Hoon core. And um, this is basically where we get back to our transition function. So um, this core basically has a very fixed battery structure. You can think of it as basically like a V table with a fixed um, um, structure. And we, we, the Unix interpreter talks to this core basically at the knock level. Um, in the lifecycle function, it's defined at the knock level. So you basically just hard code those formula offsets. Um, you, just, you can just fix that. Um, because you have only a few functions there. Um, so basically, this is how you have a system that can completely upgrade itself because, again, the whole lifecycle function is designed, defined entirely in NOC. Um, and basically, you get an, let's say you get an event, and that event is actually a source code update uh, in the revision control system that gives you new source code for, you know, Kuhn, the language itself. 
As long as your new language can build a core that is shaped like the ones that your old language built, you can turn Hoon into anything. Um, so Argo is actually a very, very simple system. It's only a few hundred lines of code. Uh, it probably should be less than 600, actually. Um, what it does is it does sort of an internal event cascade. So you're all familiar with, you know, you know like you get an event from the outside, and then you're like, this happened internally. Um, events, event systems uh, that are very complicated and deep like this one very quickly turn into spaghetti event logic. Um, there is a duality between events and procedure calls. Um, in which basically an event is, is, is a, a transfer of control, essentially. And if you, you take that duality simply, the dual, the dual of a simple event system is go-to. Um, so basically when you have, you know, you're like, oh, throw these events, and then it's like the system will go here, and it will go there, and it's like, why? Why, why, why are you doing this? So um, essentially we have what you might call the um, equivalent of uh, GoSub. For, anyone know basic in this room? Anyone? Wow. That's awesome. Um, I, I don't feel so old now. Um, and, um, um, so um, you, uh, you have essentially the equivalent of subroutines in an event kind of model. And you have basically this kind of causal model, which I don't want to get super into, but you know, definitely if you're building JavaScript event frameworks, I think you could use something like this. Uh, it also has a global type referentially transparent namespace. Um, so basically use any data in the world as if it was a type constant. Uh, that's kind of nice. Um, most of the work of, um, of Argo is done by what are called veins, which are essentially kernel modules, and they have essentially the same kind of core-like structure as the Argo core itself. So, you know, these are loaded from source, obviously, at runtime. Let me just run through, through a few of the things we do. Um, so, encrypted packet networking, we'll talk about that in a sec. Timers, obviously. Clay, which is like a typed git. Um, console, obviously, air, we'll see that hopefully driving a, a demo in a second. A uh, function build system, I don't really know how to describe that. And an application engine. And the applications, again, are cores within Gull. So you have sort of these kind of multiple levels of virtualization. When you're running user level code, you're actually running it in a virtual knock. And that virtual knock has an extra instruction. It has an instruction 11 that dereferences the basically global namespace. So you're really like you're referencing the whole world as if it was a constant. Um, you know, again, that that um, due to the way knock works, you can basically virtualize at any depth of virtual interpreters without any real cost because you're actually in the implementation just setting a flag. Um, all right, that's a very very broad overview of Arvo. Let's go back to the top and basically look at what. Um, Urbit is uh, doing at the top level. So we're, we're sort of back to the user level here. Uh, there's fortunately nothing else in the stack besides Nakuda and Arvo. Um, and at the top level, what users really see the most in Urbit is the, the public key infrastructure, kind of the identity model. Uh, basically, one Urbit is one event history, it's one state, it's one instance, and it has one identity. Uh, and you know, we basically establish that identity when we're booting the um, the Urbit, um, what exactly is this identity? What does it mean? Um, so basically, again, you know, the kind of the great thing about doing things from a clean slate is you really get to think from scratch, which is kind of neat. Um, and one thing about networking that is done kind of in a conventional, in the internet certainly, is you have these two levels of, um, okay, it's better audio. Um, you have these two levels of, um, uh, of addressing. So you have IP addresses and you have DNS. And the DNS is human meaningful and IP addresses are readable addresses. So in Urbit, this is compressed into one layer. So you actually have one layer which is both a human memorable layer and it's both a routing address and a name. Um, and it's actually your, your personal identity as well. Uh, it's also the base of, the, of a path in the global immutable namespace. Uh, so there's a problem called Zucco's Triangle. Does anyone in the room know Zucco's Triangle? We're definitely not in networking here. here. Um, that's fine. Um, Zucco's triangle basically says there are three things that you want out of an identity system. Um, you want um, the names to be human meaningful, you want them to be secure, and you want them to be decentralized. And you can get only two of those, th of, of those three things. So Facebook, secure, I hope. Uh, human, meaning, human meaningful names, definitely. Decentralized, not at all. Um, you know, uh, BitTorrent, uh, you know, decentralized, yes, human meaningful names, no. Um, and so there's basically a problem there that um, 
you know, as, as an OS guy, you know, what they teach us to do is find the trade-off and almost solve the problem. So the trade-off that we make here is basically, um, you know, the trivial solution for an identity system of this scale is basically to say, your identity is the hash of your initial public key. Very easy, IPFS uses this, very easy to do. Um, how do you remember a 128-bit hash? You don't. Um, and so what we're looking for is basically a way to make these um, names that are memorable but not meaningful. So um, first trick we do is we basically um, come up with a new way of representing numbers. Uh, many things like this have been done before, not super original, but we do a phonemic base 256. So if you look at my three numbers there, you know, there's a hexadecimal number in urban syntax, there's a uh, noon syntax, there's an IP address. We also have a syntax for that. And then there's, you know, 128, 42, 19, 109 versus patent of Tarlod. Patent of Tarlod is a lot easier to remember. It's kind of like a human name in a foreign language. Um, people actually bond with these names very easily and very quickly. Uh, I'm Tasfan Pardai, I think of myself. People say Tasfan, I turn around. Um, and um, um, so, um, of course, that's a 32-bit number, which is a lot shorter than a 128-bit number. So uh, how you get from 128 bits to uh, 32 is tricky. So you can actually do the 128-bit hash of a public key thing. That's called a comment. Anyone can create their own urban identity. That is a completely non-scarce resource. Um, and um, so, and it's also, there's just no way of making a 128-bit number uh, you know, memorable. So what you notice is that basically the most valuable real estate in this is down at the bottom of this whole 128-bit space. And in fact, you can overlay, a, you know, a 128-bit hash will never be a 64-bit number, so you can overlay a completely different 64-bit identity scheme on the bottom of this. So um, your 64-bit uh, scheme is distributed hierarchically. It's basically, it's cryptographic property, a little bit like Bitcoin, but it doesn't use a blockchain. So the way it works is that um, a 64-bit chip is, the initial key is signed by its 32-bit parent, basically the half-width prefix. The 32-bit chip is signed by a, uh, its 16-bit parent. The 16-bit chip, uh, which is a star, is signed by its 8-bit parent. And the fingerprints of 8-bit um, um, galaxies are uh, hard-coded in the kernel source. Um, this is what we call uh, pre mined in the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, world. Um, the, um, um, so, you know, basically, again, um, this is a, a, a PKI in which um, uh, revocation and renewal are the same thing. So basically, when you want to change a key, whether that's because you want to, you know, give someone else this uh, identity, or you just feel like your key might be a little bit compromised, you basically sign the new key with the old key. Unless you're a moon, moon should not be floating around on a company. You sign your own updates. So basically, um, your parent you know, signs the first key, but you sign the second. So you're genuinely independent here. Um, the main sort of um, question in that is basically how these update, updates get distributed. Fortunately, there's a lot fewer of them than sort of the equivalent, which is like a Bitcoin spend. So it's, you know, there's a lot more room for basically just sort of handling it in a, in a kind of less aggressive way than, than Bitcoin does. Um, but it's the same basic principle. Your identity is definitely cryptographic property. You own it, you can sell it, um, et cetera. And there's, you know, the 32-bit the um, point is clearly kind of the right point for human beings. One of the things about having these 32-bit names as your names is basically, like in any situation in which people are actually using this system, and some people are using it, but hopefully everyone will be using it, um, you have a scarcity there. You only have four billion. And so the price of this scarce resource cannot fall to zero. So um, one of the things and, uh, about that situation is that the basic problem, one of the reasons why my mother can't run her own internet server is that the internet is basically you know, a digital Mos Eisley. I mean, it's just all kinds of scum and villainy are out there. And uh, when you get a packet from someone, you have no way of ascertaining the reputation of this IP address. Um, yes, there are IP address reputation systems in practice. They basically turn off all residential things and don't let them send email. Um, but the ownership of an IP address is not clear. And so you can't really use, an IP address is not property, you can't really use it as a mechanism in this way. When you basically have an address that's a scarce resource, let's say you paid 10 bucks for your planet. Okay, I paid 10 bucks, I you know, want to be able to compute. Um, then you're going to send messages directly from that planet. You're definitely not going to send them through like Google or some MTU, like you know. Um, and if you spam, like someone's like, "Hey, I got a spam from Tasman Pardive. 
um, and you go on a blacklist like this, and basically your 10 bucks is now worthless um, because no one will accept anything from that planet anymore. So essentially, in order, like your spam better make you 10 bucks, or like, you know, and that's a pretty high bar for spam. And so basically, just by having this sort of limited um, supply of real estate that's treated as digital property, you basically have the basis for building a reputation system that works. Because the real killer of reputation systems is an infinite supply of identities. Because you have this problem where you, you're like, I've never seen this identity before. Maybe it's a new user. I really want to say hi. Maybe it's that spammer I just banned. I really don't want to say hi. That's kind of an unsolvable problem. Um, and so basically, I think this is one of the things like, you know, nobody, uh, a, a tiny young network like Urbit, nobody abuses. Um, but, you know, in the future, um, as you grow, basically you become a target. And so having a system like this helps you not be a target. Um, let's fall back on the point of all this. Um, inventing new system software is always a bad idea. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. Never, <laughs> never, never do this. Um, so um, let's go back to basically the, the goal of this project, which is to build a personal server. So a personal server is going to be a social server. So if you have a real personal server that's a real social server, when I socialize with you, in the ordinary case, barring like weird identity games, I should be sending packets directly to you. I shouldn't be sending packets to some Facebook thing over there that then sends them to you. I should be able to basically actually socialize in a distributed way using distributed protocols. And one of the things about the way we, the way we compute today, and the reason basically we don't um, do this, is that if you look at the difficulty of distributed programming, let's say you're building like a tic-tac-toe app. Compare the difficulty of building distributed tic-tac-toe with the difficulty of building centralized tic-tac-toe. Centralized tic-tac-toe, you know, my score, your score, they're variables. They're in the same, you know, data structure. It's easy. Then suddenly you're building distributed tic-tac-toe and you're like have to apply to the ITF for an RFC for your TTTTP, right? And you know, it's just like six orders of magnitude different in difficulty. And like, if you want to ask why we don't have a decentralized internet, basically the reason we don't have a decentralized internet is that decentralized programming is too damn hard. So basically, you need to solve this problem if you're going to build anything like a true personal server. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the kind of programming error experience of you know, where we're aiming to get with this. This is actually my next last slide. Um, so let's see, first of all, you're programming the system, you can dereference a global immutable namespace. So basically use any data in the world as if it was a typed constant. That's kind of nice. Um, your application state is permanent. You don't need a database to basically flush stuff out to when, um, you know, for your data actually. And so um, you're like, oh, I got a source code update for this thing I'm running. Then I'm like, oh, I need to change out the code. Oh, gee, my, the type of my data. Have, um, a type adapter in there to um, make that work. Uh, that all works great. Um, a very different experience from kind of up updates or upgrades in, in a lot of systems. Um, when you get to messaging um, patterns, basically, you've got um, a poke, which is a forward, basically, essentially an RPC without a return. Um, and you've got a subscription model. Uh, let's look at basically what we get with pokes for, for a moment. Uh, number one, you get exactly once delivery. Uh, you've probably heard that exactly once delivery is uh, impossible. There's a great uh, blog post about that a few months ago. Um, exactly once delivery in message semantics actually is possible if all of your entities are single level stores and if they can basically run permanent sessions. So you have a permanent session and you're like, oh, I, I expect you know, um, message seven from you. Well, you're only gonna get message seven once. Um, where that breaks down in this kind of system where you have transient and permanent state is you reboot the computer and then you're like, uh, do I expect message seven or message six? Or you know you have these um, you know um, uh, identity problems. So every message is a transaction in this kind of distributed programming environment. Um, if the tra transaction succeeds, there's no return data, so it's a one-way transaction. Um, your messages are automatically type checked and validated on the receiving side. You can even do basically protocol type updates on a live network and not propagate errors to the user. Um, your your the data that you get over the wire is passed to you typed. You basically just get it as an argument, and it's a typed value. Um, you, we do end-to-end -end acknowledgments, which basically means there's kind of a single error mode. So when you're doing acknowledgments, like think about you're, you're doing a normal uh, RPC or HTTP. Something goes wrong. Well, what could go wrong? Your socket could break. 
You could get an HTTP error. You could get an error at the RPC layer. Um, what do you even do with half of these things? Like, they're, they're different kinds of error. Um, and that basically is just very, very difficult to handle right. So if you're basically doing acknowledgments at an end-to-end -end level, that means the packet level act that you send back is actually the, um, the transaction acknowledgment that you succeeded or failed. Um, you know, messages are queued by the sender, obviously. Um, this is a P2P network, it uh, traverses uh, NAT, um, and of course it's authenticated and uh, encrypted. Your subscriptions are sending diffs, um, those again are typed. Um, so this is, this is a very different distributed programming experience than um, your sort of normal, uh, you know, uh, I'm writing this in Node uh, experience. And um, our experience is basically it's, you just do things and you pretty much just work. Um, what is the status of the system? Um, it's about 30,000 lines of Kuhn, uh, including basic apps. It's totally open source. You can go to urban.org, um, and which is served by Urbit, although uh, we cache it. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it essentially works. Uh, you know, we run occasional global flag days, so you might not want to move your business onto this system. Um, and, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, you know, this is, when you're creating a system like this involves a lot of rewriting stuff over and over again until it actually works right. Um, and um, we're basically getting to the end of that uh, process and we're kind of uh, close to being ready to sell uh, some address space to the public. Uh, let me do a um, quick uh, demo of this system uh, to see if it's uh, actually working. Uh, I'm actually doing this over my, um, uh, so here is your urban. Um, I guess we're live. That bounced off the server and came back. Uh, so that's basically a simple console um, talk app. Um, low from uh, a little bit slow on the typing there. Our console uh, path is pretty uh, complicated, and we could use some uh, serious optimization. Let me see if I can bring up the web UI of talk. Ah, uh, yes, here is a web uh, app. Um, let me get it. Uh, like it needs a reload, which it actually should not. Um, hey, when that happens. Um, but here, basically, you're seeing a, um, um, a web UI. Do you want to say something? Anyone want to say something? I'll just be below from the web and again. Um, <laughs> Boulder is beautiful. So, This has to bounce off the server to get back. Actually, the Colorado's uh, um, um, router seems to be blocking my, uh, you know, my NAT uh, 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 transition uh, directly. Um, but uh, you know, I'm doing it via Verizon, so it works fine. Taskman part of is actually running on this laptop here, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, that was a very simple demo. And now, uh, any questions? Yes. So does Richard Stallman know about this? I don't think so. <laughs> because I, I don't think this would really get to what Richard Stallman would like to see. I, I, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of people who are tired of this sort of, sort of Facebookization of the internet. And um, this is definitely also, I mean, yeah, is this a list? Is this basically Emacs? At a certain level, it's basically Emacs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, you know. Um, all right, we're at a one minute warning here. Uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. Bueller? Yes. Um, so I feel like maybe you were trying to try to be confusing where like, you, can, you use the word twig, but like always refer to it as nasty. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular reason for like these four letter scrabble nouns? Um, yeah, I mean, the reason is basically you're, um, um, you want to use the, the word that the actual source code uses. Uh, is the reason for that being the convention in the source code? Is that a good reason? Maybe not necessarily. Uh, it certainly makes things kind of tighter and more readable in a way. There's a there's an aesthetic which kind of there's an aesthetic of short names which works fairly well in kind of a functional environment which wouldn't work in an imperative environment. Um, but yeah, I mean you know the 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 criticism that this is a little more obfuscated than it has to be is certainly one that I think holds a little bit of water. So what do you what do you chat from the one message and it ends up in the browser? How do you go through the the uh, Centralized events. Uh, so that is basically um, that. Uh, if you if you saw if, if I turned on debugging here, I'll turn on debugging, and uh, you'll see uh, a lot of 
Like where, where are those packets? Okay, so um, what's actually happening is that packet, so I'm logged into, I could log in via test find part out better, but dot org, here, let me turn this off, this is horrible. Um, <laughs> and um, um, I could log in via test find part out better, but dot org and be proxied by basically the star that is, um, Task one part I is a um, planet of, um, but basically I'm in a channel, that channel is hosted on Dosnet, which is the, um, the star that I'm, I'm responsible to. And so basically that packet is going up to Dosnet, coming back to me, and then it's going over localhost 8080 to the browser. Nice. All right, any more questions? I think we're, I think we're at time. Uh, we'll talk after. All right, thanks, thanks a lot for showing up, guys. Great to be here. All right, did that record? I have two questions, actually. One was, at some point,